I'm often asked uh, who I think is the best special forces unit. Now, I'm obviously uh, very biased, and I think um, the SAS soldier is unbeatable. And that's down to the selection process, which is um, six months. But I now actually believe that the Delta Force soldiers are a much more capable and dynamic unit. And it's down to one thing, money. Life or death with Chris Ryan. My next guest today is John McPhee. John is an ex-Army Ranger, Green Beret, and a former Delta sniper. John, great to have you on the show. Hey, thank you. John, where were you born in the US and what was your childhood like? I think like most guys, my childhood was kind of shit. Uh, <laughs> I have talked to every guy I ever worked with. I had another guy's wife at a function tell me unit guys were a generation of fatherless guys. And I'm like, you're full of shit, right? And I'm intentionally not saying who she is because you know who she is, right? You would know her husband. And I'm like, come on, you know what I mean? Like we're at like a social function. We're just kind of bullshitting. She said, you guys are fatherless. And I was like, no way, right? So kind of stuck with me. And I went around and I asked everybody what their childhood was like. And it kind of boiled down to three things. The first and the easiest one, the guy was the football star. He dated the cheerleader and now he's here. You know what I mean? Because he's a, he's a proud American or for you guys, a proud, you know, Brit or, and that was like the half a percent. Like I only met, I only asked one guy that was his story. Everyone else is your dad worked. He came home, he passed out drunk. He woke up, he was gone before you woke up. He came home, he was in bed before you woke up. He was kind of absent or you had a rough childhood. Like back in the 70s, 60s, you probably caught some beatings. People don't do that anymore, but that's how people were raised. So I grew up in Chicago, kind of had a rough childhood. My mom had me, she was really young. You know, she got divorced, grew up with a stepdad. He was a truck driver. He was, you know, out of the house at three in the morning. He was home at five at night. He was asleep by seven. You know what I mean? In their free time, they hung out in a bar. I grew up in the bar, eating bar food, you know, running around outside with the other kids outside of the bar. And then, you know, all the stuff that goes along with that is they get drunk. Me and my brother would catch beatings once in a while. You know what I mean? Like, but I, I honestly think like, this might sound weird, but I honestly think like, this is how 1970 was. Yeah, John, I, well, I was brought up in the 60s and it's your, you're mirroring my upbringing. And but what I can say, though, if I caught a beating off my father, I usually deserved it. It wasn't like, you know, dished out just for, you know, for him to enjoy it. It was basically I'd stepped out of line. So I could never complain because that was the, you know, that was the right. life in, back in those days. But again, right. what you're saying, so many guys have just said exactly the same as what you've just come out with. Yeah, dude. I wrote uh, a while ago, you know, uh, when I kind of became leadership in the unit or as a 2IC and then when I was leadership, I started taking notes, keeping notebooks, right? Because you can't keep up, especially during the war, you can't keep up with everything that, you know, we talk about in the meeting, I'm writing it down. I'm going back through my notes. What do you need to know? You need to make sure nothing falls through the cracks, right? Mm -hmm. This is the way yeah. you fuck shit up. So while I was taking notes, uh, it was about the same time I was asking guys if, you know, they were follow this. And, and I actually wrote, uh, I don't know, just a few paragraphs on what I found one day, just kind of taking notes, getting organized. I wrote a few paragraphs. I'd, I'd have to go back and find it. But it's really interesting that guys like us were raised by a generation of fatherless. And then some guys didn't get beat, but it was the same story. Their dad worked so many hours a day. He was an absentee figure, kind of, you know, even though on the weekends they might play ball or uh, me and my brother caught a lot of beatings because my parents drank a lot. You know, they were drunk and yeah. they would get mad over shit. That, as, <laughs> as little kids, I didn't know why they were mad, but it was like, uh, me and my brother used to joke about it. Like, oh, we're going to catch a beating, you know? Um, so sometimes I got beat because I deserved it. Yeah. Right. And sometimes I got beat because they were drunk. I think either way it builds, I don't even know what to call it. Right. But it builds like 
guys that were beat as little kids, right? Like we catch a beating and then we had to sit down at dinner table and act civilized or go to someone's house and act like nothing happened. And I think in war, this builds this resilience where no matter what just happened, I can accept it. I can come back down and move on. And I think, you know, if you were beaten as a child, you're going to do great as a commando, you know, and uh, a couple of my buddies, like, you know, like anyone in war, like we've seen our share of uh, bad situations, whether we like it or not. And I've had a few guys at different times be like, you're unshakable. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Mike. We got shit to do. Like, not the time to talk about it. Only to kind of look back at that's what eating all those beatings were like, you know, I'd eat a beating in the car and then it was time to go to grandma's house. And then we had to be cool for grandma. And I think that builds something in the core of a dude that actually is one of the best qualities I would say in war is be able to, we go from level 10 to zero to move on. Right. Because you can't always stay level 10 when level 10 is not where you're going to make your best decision. No, you, you are absolutely right there. And where it comes in to its own is usually when you're doing selection, whether it be for the Green Army or for Special Forces, you are getting beasted. You've got a guy in your face all the time, kicking your ass and really being nasty. And then the next thing, you, you know, you're sat in that canteen with your mates right. and you accept it, you suck it in and you know there's more to come and you take it. And, you yeah. know, you just get in because that's the life. I can remember when stepping forward slightly but um when i joined the regiment i went into b squadron and the, the oh, seats... i'll forgive you for that but, uh <laughs> normally that's you, fuck you. <laughs> that's the fighting words right there yeah. and um basically they didn't speak to you for um three or four months right then when i was a you know when i was leaving as a staff sergeant i had guys turning up on day one saying uh, can i have a word with you i'd like to talk about my uh, career prospects and you're like, fuck off, you know, and the world <laughs> just changes. But going back, did you join the military straight from school? No. My stepdad was good at recognizing what me and my brother did well. And he always pushed my brother to get good grades because my brother's super smart, right? School was easy for him, right? So he always pushed my brother in that direction. Him being a truck driver and owning his own truck, I was mechanically inclined so I would service this truck, change the oil, change the brakes. By the time I was like 12, I was completely doing all this service on like, you know, his 18 wheeler truck, you know. Um, and then I started working in the truck shops as a kid. And I, you know, of course, I had to work my way up. I started just pumping diesel and gas. Remember when people used to stand out and give yes, me gas? Yeah, yeah. Like, like I used to do that all day long, you know. And then as a kid, I just worked there. And uh, the boss at the time was this old guy. He was kind of like the father figure I didn't have at home, even though I had a, you know, he was like another father figure to me. And like the guy would just tell me to do stuff. And then, you know, I tried to show up on time because I respected him. Now, some of the other people I worked with, I didn't like them at all, but, you know, he always took good care of me. So I worked through truck shops. I graduated high school. I still continued to work in truck shops. Like uh, I was a welder and a mechanic. Eventually I got to the point where, my hands were black, like cut up black every day from doing all this. I got to the point where I was like, you know, what girl is going to date a guy with, with hands that are all, even clean are always black. I was like, you know, and as a teenage kid, I'm thinking, no girl is going to let me stick my hand down her pants with my hands looking like this ever, ever. So I figured, man, I can't do this forever. And, uh, you know, my, my whole family, my grandpa was a paratrooper in World War II. You know, my whole family was in the army my stepdad was a marine like they had all served you know i was raised by the world war ii generation didn't even know it um and then i just kind of always knew i would join and i figured i was i was almost 21 so i figured now's the time yeah and what what di uh, what directed you to the uh, the rangers and and also what's the difference with the rangers compared to an, like say a normal infantry unit yeah so the rangers I tried to join the Air Force to be a mechanic because <laughs> I was a mechanic and a welder. And I figured I fixed shit. They got shit that needs to be fixed. I figured airplanes are cleaner than gravel haul and trucks. So all things being equal, I do the same thing and be cleaner. Um, and I took the, I took all the tests and the Air Force like, son, um, 
Yeah, I'm looking at your scores. You high, he said, you, you scored high enough to be admin. And I'm like, great, great. What's admin? And he was like, you'd like type memos and, you know, you do paperwork. And I'm like, uh, my mom's a secretary. I'm not a secretary, right? And he's like, son, have you talked to the Army yet or the Marine Corps? I'm like, no, I want, I'm a mechanic. I want to be a mechanic. You guys fix stuff for a living, right? And he was like, eh, I don't think so, son. Not for you, right? So I was kind of crushed and I didn't know what to do because I was kind of ready and I wanted like I wanted to join and leave right now. You know what I mean? Let's just let's just do this. I don't want a delayed entry where I might change my mind later, right? Like so I went to the uh, a buddy of mine was he was a ranger and he got out, he blew out his knee or something, so he got medically, you know, kind of out of the army in general. And uh he was like, yeah, I was in the 75th Ranger Regiment. It was awesome. We ran every morning. We did cool shit. We jumped out of planes. And I'm like, well, that sounds cool. The mechanic thing kind of didn't work out for me. So maybe I'll just tell the Army guys I want to be a Ranger. And then I went in there, you know, and uh, I was like, yeah, I want to be an Airborne Ranger. And they're like, son, have you seen the video? And I'm like, there's a video? This sounds awesome. Yeah. No, I want to watch. And uh and then the guy just starts laughing and then like, you know, the guy, the, the senior enlisted in like the recruiting office, he's like, hey, Bob, we got another guy that wants to be a ranger, right? And they laughed at me. And I was like, this is kind of screwed up, but whatever, right? And, um, you know, I joined and then, you know, back in my day, the difference is the rangers were kind of just light infantry that worked with special operations nowadays they're so embedded it's so you know they're all together for funding for resourcing for logistics but in my day it was just light infantry right Mm -hmm. like i think we back in the day i don't think we had better gear i don't think we had uh because we had all army stuff back in the day hell when i got to the unit we didn't have anything fucking fancy Mm -hmm. like they got today like I got like army stuff when I got to the unit, the same stuff I had in the Rangers, right? So the difference was, is they were just kind of light infantry that had slightly different missions. You know what I mean? The airfield seizure was the bread and butter where like they jump in, they kind of seize it. And then the 82nd comes in after or the other paratroopers, whatever. So it was just slightly different missions. But I would say when I joined the Rangers, it wasn't truly... I guess it's always been special operations, but when I was there, you know, in the nineties, I would say it wasn't really not like today. Yeah. And then how long did you spend in the Rangers before you went to the green berets? Man, I was there about five years. Right. And, uh, the, the SAR major at the time, I know you guys, what do you call them? Warrants, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Warrant officers. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our SAR major, the senior enlisted at the time was like, if you had been around a while, uh, you start out in the Rangers, they let you come up to a certain point, And then they're like, you need to transfer your knowledge to the army. Like, you can make a difference in a million people, but whatever, right? So uh, it crazy stuff would happen, guys would come on orders to go other places. And uh, he was starting to ship guys out other places. So a buddy of mine went to SFAS. And I was like, how was it, you know, the special forces selection? for being a green beret. And I was like, how was it? And he was like, nothing every day you couldn't do. And I was like, I could do that. Right. And, mm. uh, I went and went to special forces from there. And was that on the car in North Carolina at Bragg? Yeah. 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 At Bragg. Yeah. And how long was the selection for green berets? Oh uh, man, like a month, you know, like kind of maybe kind of three weeks of training, you know, a couple days before, or after essentially about a month back then, I think. Would that be like our Pathfinders with the Parachute Regiment? Um, yeah, your paras are like rangers. Um, you know, you truly don't have a special forces like us. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you, uh, you guys don't have a white side, right? And the paras are kind of white and black, right? Yeah. Is they can support the army or they can support you guys. Yeah. So the the green berets here is a mix of uh paras and some of what you guys do right. makes sense totally. it's yeah 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 totally, um, totally right yeah for you guys i mean i think you guys let's see probably around 09 
started to mirror us a little more. John, there was, it was light and day when the regiment was side by side with Delta under, I think it was McChrystal, and you, you started on Task Force Black. And this is where the regiment's kit, their procedures, everything changed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, having said that, we're your poor cousins. I mean, you know, we don't have right. a pot to piss in. And what the good thing is, is when you brought them, the two, you know, two countries together or special forces together, that's when the regiment said, here, we want the new uniforms. We want the kit. We want this. We want the support, everything. Yeah. And that regiment nearly changed overnight. And that was just down to the collaboration with Delta. Well, I would say this is, uh, from my perspective, you know, when we went into Baghdad and we took the houses and you guys moved in next door to us, right? Like, yes, seriously, yeah. right? We're like, I've heard these hey, stories. Yeah, like, come with us, right? And they're like, okay. And it's like, all right, you know, uh, here, you guys, we're going to hit this place tonight. You guys take these buildings. We got these buildings. You know, no, no real preference. Just, mm. we got all these buildings. You take some, we take some, right? And then you guys were still a night vision device on the weapon, and we're all wearing aviation goggles and lasers. And it's like, dudes, that's how you guys did it. Like, you don't even, you guys didn't even have individual night vision yet. You oh, had, yeah, no, totally. I mean, I, I, I was talking to another lad. He said the Delta guys had in their grab bags another set of uh, night vision goggles, you know, and they've got this and we're, we're still carrying the starlight or the, you know, kite sight. Yeah, the starlight, going, yeah. Going back, when um, I, when I, um, escaped in the 1991 uh, Gulf War. I, I ended up, um, when I got back to my unit, um, A Squadron and Delta were going into a, an area where I'd, I'd spent 24 hours there. And um, they, they basically said, will you come up and talk to us to give us a, a perspective of the ground and you know what it's like there? So yeah, I went up there and it was um, General Wayne Downing. And I sat with him in his office, told him the story and he went, he said, and this is, this is how great I think American officers are. He said to me, uh, so what has the doctor said to you, uh, to you? And I said, well, I haven't had time to see a doctor. I was sent straight up here to talk to you guys. And he had like his face changed. And he went, geez, I, I'm, I apologize about this. You need to go and see a doctor. He said, we've got some go faster surgeons next door. And I said, well, listen, I'll talk to the squadron first and then, you know, see the doctors. And he was a great guy. He would bring me over to the Kennedy Center after, like months after to do the old lessons learned and things like that. And I yeah. spoke with Air Squadron just before they were going in. Some of the guys said, um, so how come you ended up walking for, you know, like seven days, eight nights and nobody came and picked you up? And I went, well, we don't have any helicopters. And, that, you know, well, why did they not send a jet up there? I went, no, nah, I've got no jets. And they were like, fucking hell you what and then the guys were saying <laughs> what sort of kit did you have i said well i lost it all like you know and then no satcoms i was like no none of that mate and on one of the trips coming across to bragg it was a guy i'm sure he was from the green berets he was an officer and he picked us up and he he said um what are you over for and i said oh i'm talking about my escape and evasion and uh he said um i said i i had an escape and evasion during the first gulf war and um, I said, how long were you on the run for? He went, he just said 17. Then I went, 17 days. And he looked at me, he went, no, 17 hours. And then he started telling me he was being chased by this Iraqi force, but they had 37 aircraft above following them, protecting them. And that's when I got it, you know, I realized the American war machine is unstoppable once that thing gets rolling and the assets you have. And that's why... The development within SF is led by the Americans and it's down to finances and budget and the fact that they're prepared mm -hmm. to pour it in onto you. The, the budget's way different. Yeah, it was, it was always amazing to me that uh, when I was in Iraq and we'd go out with the guys like, you know, hey, whatever we got, like, they'll just give us this stuff. Here, take it. Mm -hmm. It started out with little things like pelter earmuffs. <laughs> you guys are still wearing like earplugs and a thing and like, and because you got an earplug and you're on the radio and it's like, I can be like, man, are they making radio calls in the next building? How come we hear them? Like here, take, be like, here, I'll go get a new one. Take this. And they're like, fuck that. Couldn't believe it. And it was, it started with little stuff. And then, 
What killed me is some of the international laws. Uh, there was a few times where I had to argue to our government, to our people, like, look, you don't understand. Like, we're shoulder to shoulder every night. These guys need to have this stuff because it, it'll compromise our lives and their lives. And if we all had the same stuff, then what was, it was always interesting to me is um, you guys don't have a white side for special operations. You only have the black side, right? Yeah. Well, here in America, we have the black side which is modeled after you guys. And then we have the white side and the white side would be arguing me because the stuff you need. And it's like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, mm -hmm. shut the fuck up. We got guys together right, right now, as I speak, like give them the fucking shit they need, you know? And yeah. uh, it was, it was kind of amazing to me that in combat, we could give you guys stuff, but if you guys wanted to buy it, we couldn't sell it to you or there'd be, oh man, it, it was always something, you know? Oh no, it was the procurement uh, side of things where everything had to be checked and you're like, are you kidding me? Because going back to the eighties before Kevlar came out, we were dealing with L LAPD because they had Kevlar vests, they had the shields, the helmets, and the regiment was having to go through a, a you know, a second party to get that stuff for us to use. And it, it's, it, there's too much paperwork but going back and list, well, talking to some of the young operators, they said, you know, when we first deployed out to Iraq on the second Gulf, we would maybe do an operation once every couple of months. And then he said, as soon as we had the collaboration in that task force black, we were banging out three operations at per night, possibly more being briefed in the helicopter as we're going down on the second target. And I was like, fucking hell, that is stressful. Yeah. Well, one of my first jobs in Iraq was I had to take in every intel report from the American intelligence agencies and I had to read them and I had like, I had baskets and there was like three of us, like I was a recce guy, like I'm a sniper. I don't read fucking reports all day. Right. And I'd be like, oh, this seems like British. They go in the black basket. Oh, this one's for us. Give that to the army. I don't know what to do with that in the, I don't know what to do basket. Like I had all these baskets and every day I would just, I'd go to uh, some of your commanders and I'd be like, yeah, here's all your Intel. Like, and they'd be like, this is from one day. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, this is one day. And then I'd have to, I'd be elsewhere and I'd have to run down to the houses in Baghdad and hand it all out. Shit. Right, because it was all hard copy paper shit back then, you know? Like no, no, that was one thing. The intel was was absolutely brilliant. That came out of Washington a lot of the time. And you, again, going back to 1991, you had the facility of the old um, satellite imagery where they were giving us maps dating back to 1944. We could, if we'd requested it, have a, right. an image actually on our desk that was 24 hours old. And they and yeah. sorry, I think it was twelve hours. But if we wanted analysis on it by an expert, it was twenty-four hours, and that expert would tell you whether a vehicle had been there, whether there was footprints on the ground, and everything. And it was just, it was just mind blowing. Yeah. And we're handing that shit out like candy before to everyone on the ground. So you got you know what you're looking yeah. at. You know what I mean? And and uh, yeah, I remember those days, man. But. It's crazy. So how did you find the difference between operating in, in Iraq to Afghanistan? Iraq's easy war. On a scale of one to 10, the enemy in Afghanistan is probably a two. On a scale of one to 10, the enemy in Iraq, I'll give them a three. On a scale of one to 10, the terrain in Afghanistan mm -hmm. is a nine. Yeah. On a scale of one to 10, the terrain in Iraq is a one. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Cause again, talking to like my younger friends there, they were saying the movement in Afghanistan was a complete and utter nightmare. And if you were out on the ground, the, the Taliban could set some elaborate ambushes and just wait, you know, for the, the premium targets. But, yeah. And it's the same thing they did for the Russians. Yes. Their playbook never changed. Same spots, same everything, same munitions. You know, all taught to them by us mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and you guys, yeah. right? And then here we come and they're doing the same shit to us. So, nope. um, yeah, the terrain makes Afghanistan hard. 
Also, I think the uh, the the none of the terrain also limits communication between people. And what I mean is, you know, I think it's like eighty percent of the Muslim world is illiterate, mm-hmm. right? And that's every Muslim nation. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably as of like twenty eleven. So how do they get their news? You know what I mean? They get their news from trying to talk to each one another. Make sense? Yeah. So they get their news from that. Well, they only know what people tell them. There was places in Afghanistan, they see us. They didn't even know about Russians. They're just like, wow, we never seen white people. Who are you? <laughs> you know, kind of deal. Yeah. And uh, there's other places we went where they thought we were Russians. And I was like, we're not Russians. What are you guys talking about? But that's the last communications they had out of their little area with anybody. So in Iraq, being terrain being easy, having cities and highways, and they're all connected and easier to get around, word travels fast, a lot faster than some places in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mind you, that goes back to the Vietnam days where the Vietnamese were indoctrinating the, the people and they said, you're going to see some white, white faces there will be about six foot high and they'll eat you. And they kept spreading this shit and they'll kill you, they'll eat your children and all the rest of it. So they were fearful of American soldiers when, when they saw them right. on the ground. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, I think communication's a big thing in those two countries. And, and, you know, look, Iraq at one point was the most civilized Western country in the Muslim world. Look, Saddam, as bad as he was, he kept Iran in check. Yeah. He kept... You know, he was allies with Syria, which kept Syria stabilized. He allowed Christians. There was huge Christian districts in Baghdad. You know, the guy who bought his clothes, the guy who fed him, the guy who washed his ass, anybody in Saddam's inner circle that could personally touch Saddam was a Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a Muslim, right? Because he believed if a Muslim kills himself and Saddam, he's going to heaven. Christian kills himself, he's going to hell. Saddam surrounded himself by Christians. So Saddam was really moderate, but, you know, Iraq was a very kind of civilized Western country for the Middle East, even in early 90s, even in. So the Iraqi people becoming more civilized and understanding more of how the world works is just how Iraq has been way more than Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where, where were you most concerned? Which theater of operations were you most concerned for your safety and your men? I don't know. I wasn't really worried either or. Maybe that's a bad attitude to have, but like, be smart. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. don't stick your head up when you're not supposed to. You know what I mean? Like, if we got to take a risk, let's, let's calculate these risks. Let's minimize these risks by time or by, you know, so... I've had a few hairy days in both, but I would say Afghanistan could be scarier because they could catch you somewhere where you don't want to be, right? Versus Iraq, where mostly urban environments, you know what I mean? Like, just like we talked about, you know, we we got a package of helicopters. They're just waiting to come pick us up. That's all they do is they wait to come pick us up. That's what they do, right? That's not happening in Afghanistan. If you're above X amount of feet, they don't have a helicopter that can come get you. So I would say the remoteness of Afghanistan could be a a little bit more worrisome than Iraq, you know, Mm -hmm. but um, I would say probably the most dangerous, I think Iraq was kind of Zarqawi time, going after Zarqawi and post-Zarqawi. You know, because I kind of feel like in the beginning of Afghanistan, they had no idea who we were, what we were doing. It was easy. You know what I mean? And then I felt the same in Iraq. And once they figured us out, how we operate, how we do shit, we kill all the dumb ones. Actually, we probably kill all the the retarded ones first, right? Because you roll up on a village and this guy's running at you, Mm -hmm. you know? So, and then I think we killed all the dumb ones. And then somewhere through the war, we're left with like, really smart guys who are survivors, you know what I mean? Who have kind of seen stuff enough to understand like what they need to do to survive. And 
I would say this is uh, a lot of people say there's a million ways to skin a cat, right? You've heard this before. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's not a million ways to skin a cat. You know what I mean? There's probably only a couple ways to skin a cat. But as you're skinning that cat, there's probably some stuff you absolutely under no circumstances don't want to do. Like you don't want to puncture the guts. Then you got to skin it and smell shit the whole time, right? So I would say if you could learn those do not do's, whether this was us, Iraqis, Afghanistan, if you knew what not to do, you could, this could pan out anyway, and it's just going to be just fine. Yeah. I don't, I don't think people really get it in terms of the scale of that conflict in, in the second Gulf, where it wasn't as if you were hitting an army, it was cells right. and, and bad guys trying to make a name for themselves and shit like that. And the fact what was good with, the US is you had the agency, you know, setting up and then actually getting intel in. Because when you first get there, it's like, well, who is the target? If you don't know, and you have to have that done. And then how do we hit these fuckers? Yeah, I, I also would say in the beginning in Iraq and Afghanistan, they kind of had no intel. And I felt like we would hit targets just to generate intel to lead us where to go next. I remember being like, We're going to hit this guy tonight. Why? We need intel. So we generate intel? Like, that's not how it works, but it was how it works. And then, you know, a little while into it, stuff starts trickling in. People realize, like, hey, you know, my life could be better if I just got rid of the bad guys. And I felt like in the beginning, there there really wasn't any good intel. We We were hitting targets to generate intel to jumpstart the system, but somewhere along the line, Intel started pouring in as well. And it was a, it was a dual thing. And I'd say, you know, most of our Intel came from technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John, can I ask you a question? It's a personal question. Like, is it true that you did a solo op in Afghanistan? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a week. Did you volunteer for this? Well, yeah, but uh, all right, hold on. Yes. I volunteered. But what I didn't know is other guys had turned it down. I didn't know I could turn it down. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, I got to go do this. Uh, I'm in the army. I do what you tell me. Okay, I let, let me figure this out, right? Like, I didn't know till I got back. A buddy of mine was like, dude, I can't believe you went and did that. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, I turned him down. That shit's crazy. I was like, I could turn him down? What the fuck? If I'd have known I could turn him down, I probably would have. And how long were you on, on your own for? About a week. Yeah, week to 10 days. And how far was friendly forces away from me? Fuck, man. I had to go from uh, Jalalabad into the Tora Bora Mountains. So that's like a two or three day drive taking public transportation and kind of hitchhiking like Afghans. Fuck, you weren't dropped in by like, like covertly. Oh, fuck no, man. I was in a taxi and then I found a logging truck and I fucking just, yeah. Yeah. How the fuck did you get away with this? Uh, I didn't talk. Right? Because, look, um, have you been to Afghanistan? No, I haven't. But I've, I've been around quite a few of them. Now, the, the vast majority are big old units, aren't they? The guys. No, you know, I, I suspect the Russians did a lot of fucking. And there's bigger guys. There's, you know, guys like I used to have a big red beard. You see guys with red beards. So... Um, although I think I might have been wider than most, you know, because I was fit, I was, you know, maybe not as skinny. I really didn't look out of place, I think. And you were tooled up, I take it, when you were... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wore I wore my, you know, my Pakul, my Afghan roll-up hat. I wear my... I had my man dress, you know, all the way down to my knees. I had a vest. Um, and then... For my gear, I carried a, uh, I still got it somewhere. I don't know where it is, but it was a plastic bag and it was like Kent cigarettes. And I carried that like, and then all this shit is like, I got at the market the day before. Like, I just like looked around the market. What have people got here in Jalalabad? And like, I try to do the same. Shit. And was this like a recon? (laughs) Was this recon? Yeah. Yeah. Recon and snatch. Yeah. Well, you, you, you went in and snatched somebody. I did the recon and then I had to Trojan horse everybody through all these tribal lines and checkpoints. And we did the Trojan horse. We built, 
the the guys back at uh, you know at Bagram built these things that fit in the back of these logging trucks that it looked like it was full with water bottles, but it was you know yeah. that big is is a facade, right? So we we I had to figure out the Trojan horse for everybody to bring them in um you know under everyone's eye and then uh we raided the house and then they went out by helicopter um you know we snatched like the last guy that knew where bin laden was in in tora bora and tora bora isn't a friendly place anyway is it because there was a there's been a couple of big uh, scraps there hasn't there yeah yeah matter of fact this year is it this year the end of last year right um they just fought ISIS against America and the Taliban in Tora Bora. Because my, my neighbor, who uh, another unit guy, uh, he's now a SAR major. He was the SAR major over it. And when he came home, he was like, dog, I was thinking about you this trip. I'm like, you were thinking about me? Like, you know what I mean? I hope I had clothes on. What the fuck are you thinking about me for? And he goes, it was us and the Taliban against ISIS in Tora Bora. We had to retake it. I'm like, shut up. And he goes, funny thing is, you know who the Taliban hates more than us? ISIS. And I was like, that, that's Yeah, that's mind-blowing when you think of what's gone on, you know, over the last 20 years. That is. Yeah. Yeah, because a, a couple of my good friends, they were at, you would have probably been at that fight in Tora Bora, one of the first ones where they were trying to get into the yeah. caves. And we had yeah, two, two lads, two lads got wounded. Or two of our lads. We had a few guys with us. Yeah. We had guys with us. Yeah. Yeah. I'd recognize them. Well, maybe now that we're all old, I may not recognize them, but uh, I'd recognize them if I, I'd like to recognize them if I seen them. But yeah, we had, we had some SBS guys with us too. Yeah. Matter we'll fact, not talk, about, we'll not talk about them. <laughs> Hey, I'm just saying before, <laughs> while you guys were still too proud to get in the mix, the SBS is like, fuck it, we'll go. <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> when you look at right? the politics, yeah, you're absolutely true. They were sent out there um, whilst the lads were in Iraq. And then when Iraq was closing up, they were like, right, we want to go into Afghanistan now. But- yeah, well, you guys are like, hey, we got stuff to do. We got our own missions. Because we're like, we need more people. I mean, only 10 of us went in the original Tora Bora mission. You know, I don't know. We killed, like, my first day, we killed hundreds of dudes. I mean, I don't even know how you count it, you know? Yeah. And uh, we're like, we need dudes. And then a couple days later, we get asked. We're like, hey, I know there's some SAS guys here. Like, get them with us. And, uh, you know, they're, we got some Brits. And it was like, awesome. Who are you guys? They're like, SBS. Like, well, who? I didn't even know who the fuck that was. I'm like, who the fuck are you guys? <laughs> and then they told me, I'm like, so you guys are like our Navy SEALs? Oh, I don't think this is going to work. Like, because we don't roll like that around here. But <laughs> it turns out you're, the SBS was... They do the same right, selection right, now, right, same training, right. and they're good guys. Right. Did, you, did you enter the caves? Did you go in to clear the caves? Oh, yeah, all of them, man. Yeah. And me, me and two other guys dropped all the ordnance then. I just on the radio constantly, constantly. And we'd move to a ridge line. We'd see them on the other ridge line. B-52s, like fucking thousands of pounds of bombs. You know what I mean? Like when, uh, and then me and two other guys went forward to kind of start tracking them down. And uh, we were we were about to cross a ridge line and like 50 cows started shooting at us. RPGs going over our heads. So I get on, I get on the radio and I'm like, hey, you know, we're in contact. We need fire kind of deal. I'm doing my thing. And uh, I'm like, they're like, I called them in danger close. And uh, uh, the pilot was like, oh, you got to be 600 yards away. So I, the other dudes I was with, I cover up to my hand mic. I'm like, hey, how far are we? And he's like, I don't know, three, 400 yards. Get behind a rock. You're cleared hot. And like, <laughs> it's like, poo, felt like it's going to suck your shirt off. You know what I mean? And then out of the mushroom clouds, these dudes started shooting, firing RPGs back at us. We had to do it again. How did they survive? Fuck if I know. I'll tell you this is uh, the original, the original battle of Tora Bora, there was a lot of Chechens and those guys, like their machine guns were cleaned and oiled and, you know, they had rags where they were wiping them down and they, they were incredibly disciplined soldiers. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. To where, like, you know, 
they I thought they were the biggest threat over like there was Saudis there, there were some Jordanians, you know, Al Qaeda was a hodgepodge, you know, whoever would volunteer, but them Chechens, great soldiers, great soldiers. Nothing but respect for those guys. And you go to their fighting positions and they'd have like sector stakes. They'd have like everything I would have done, you see these guys do after like we'd bomb the place, you know? Yeah. And how far did these cave systems go in into the mountain? It depended, man. I mean, there was one that had ammunition in it. So they got, I don't even know who went in it. Guys went in it and they had, a, they were like getting all the ammunition out. Right. So, you know, if we leave, they can't come back and there's a ton of ammo there. And they threw ammo cans down a mountain for like three days. They're just chucking them over the mountain out of the cave, letting them roll down the mountain. And then we're trying to pick them up from the bottom of the mountain and carry them out on like donkeys and that. But like three days, like I don't know how many guys would grab a crate of ammo, throw it over the side into the valley for the donkeys and that to walk it out to trucks. Like days, like I don't know how much it was, but it was a fucking lot. It is mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> Just go back to when you call that into danger close. What's the sensation like, you know, when, when from giving the call on the radio to that, the first bomb hitting the ground? You know, we had done that so many times and I was already so, you know, sleep deprived. Like, you know, when, when we would try to get sleep at night, we'd call the gunship Right. And we tell the, the gunships, the AC 130s, where we were, you know, because you never tell the Air Force where you are because they'll fucking drop a, you give them a coordinate, there's going to be a bomb there. Never give them your coordinates. But the gunships, being our guys, right? Like we would kind of give them a vicinity where we were and anything else out there, like on your thermals, you smoke them and then like we just clear them hot. And, you know, look, you know, I think we were at like, I don't know. 10, 12, 14,000 feet at times, somewhere in there. You know, the, the airplanes fly 20,000 feet and they just circle and they just shoot shit on the ground. You know, the 40 millimeter grenades, you know, the 155s, you know, the, the chain cannons, whatever they got. You couldn't sleep. They were just mowing dudes down all night long. You couldn't sleep. Like, and then during the day, we'd have to call in fires. You know, the gunships would leave. We'd have the B-52s, you know, you name it. Like, I didn't even know what to do. My first call for fire, we had, a, you know, we always bring our Air Force guy with us to talk Air Force to the Air Force planes. And uh, he was getting tired and he was getting sloppy. And I'm like, dude, don't you fucking drop no bombs on us, motherfucker. I was like, look, you want me to take over? And he was like, yeah. And he's like, say this. So I'm like... So I said what he said and like, it was like magic. And I'm like, I didn't even know what I just told him. Right. And then like some other guy, like there were so many planes wanted to drop bombs. Like I'd have like 10, 15 planes all in line stacked up doing fire missions on stuff we see in, in, in every way imaginable. And, you know, the first time another plane checks in, I didn't know what to say. So I like kick him and he's like, you know, he's been up for like 36 hours. And I'm like, Hey, this guy just checked in. He's like, yeah, uh, tell him to check in with so-and-so, deconflict his airspace. So I'm like, so I tell him that. And then the pilots start talking to each other, lining each other up. And, and I'm like, that's all you got to say? This shit's easy, right? Um, afterwards, like, uh, he got a silver star from the Air, uh, Air Force out of it. Afterwards, he was like, hey, you know, they keep all those logs for fire missions. And... Um, he was like, hey, you know, you get credit for these. And I'm like, maybe in the Air Force. No one gives a fuck where I work. And he's like, hey, uh, I can, he's like, I separated all your call for fires. Like, I'd like to give you all this stuff. And then you could, you could get like, you know, controller certified or something. I'm like, dude, what am I going to do with that? I'm a unit guy. We got it done. Like, but uh, like he got promotions, you know, Air Force guys, they get stuff for that by us. Like, you just made it happen. No one gives a shit. No, John, you've got the bronze star, though, haven't you? A bunch of them, yeah. How many? Uh, five. I think five. It is what it is, right? Like, I never asked for one of them. I'd have done it for, <laughs> hey, I'd have done it for free. You know what I'm saying? Like, when, you, when you're out there just kind of doing stuff, like, especially, you know, with uh, Afghanistan, like, 
being a recce guy, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, I was never at the base. I was never, we were always somewhere else doing stuff to prep for the guys to, so like they'd have these big award ceremonies and then like I get back, I get back to the States and I'd be like, I got all this stuff. That's pretty cool. I never really cared about the awards. You know what I mean? Like, and, and then, you know, that's not why you do it anyway. I, I would say, I would say the biggest thing, and this is even for you guys, I would say the biggest thing is, you never want to let down the guy to your left or right. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely yep. true. John, before we just have a quick talk on SOB, just yeah. describe what's it like sitting on that skids of a, of a mini bird flying in on a hot target. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I always felt like the little birds uh, were safer than other helicopters because those guys can land anywhere. Like, Shit goes bad in a Black Hawk. You need a big area for this to go down. I seen them little little bird guys land in like courtyards or, you know, little alleys. Like I had to call them in one day and they're like, we're going to sit down in the alley. And I'm like at the gate of the back alley. I'm like, okay, right. And they sat down. I opened the door and the blade is like two inches from the door. Like I was like, holy cow, close the door. Like too much wind. But uh in Afghanistan, right? Not a lot of little bird work. Uh, in Iraq, I think I got an air medal for doing 37. I don't remember how many it is on the medal, but I got an air medal. I, an army guy, got an air medal for riding on those pods for so many missions. And uh, in Iraq, it sucked because when it's 110 degrees out, you're just getting blasted with 110 degree air. You think like guys are like, Oh man, you know, especially as a sniper, you're always on the little birds because they're versatile. They can chase people down, right? Which is what we did. What guys don't realize is like, dude, I bet it's so cool up there on the little bird. Like, are you on crack? It's still 110 degrees, you know? So little birds are fun. The skid is fun. Um, you know, that's a learning. That's a skill set within itself, getting on, off, you know, making sure like you're hooked in. Um, but uh, little birds are always fun. Always, always fun. No, the footage that has been released, um, it, it looks absolutely amazing. It looks like you're sitting on just a little Ferrari. Yeah. And, yeah. Around. and then pilots must be probably the, the top pilots in the world for flying. Yeah. And the debris that they've got to, you know, negotiate to get onto your platform. Yeah. Uh, the little bird guys are good. Whether it's the attack helicopters that just do the rockets and machine guns, or it's the... Um, you know, the, the guys who ride guys around those, those, the, the little birds are probably my favorite helicopters to ride in. I think for sure, man, those guys are good. So when it came to time to leave the military, was that your decision or was it, um, it was it, was it your age or? Uh, yeah. You know, look, you get to 20 years, you can retire. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I'm always, uh, unlike some guys, I never felt like my identity was the unit like and you know guys like this their life if if this wasn't their life they'd have nothing and then you know now that i'm retired like you know they still have dinners or functions i call it the prom you got to dress up and you go to dinner and they you meet the guys and that and they do that stuff and one of the guys who worked for me i was his boss he's now one of the head star majors and he's always trying to get me to come back out there to you know meet the guys and stuff and it's kind of weird because I felt like it's a train and it's going fast. And one day it stops and you get on and one day it's going to stop and you're going to get off. And as soon as you get off, you're going to look back at the train. It's going to be so far away. You don't even know where it went. Right. So I always felt like a lot of guys say this is lead, follow, get the fuck out of the way. I felt like I followed, I led yeah. and now it's my turn just to get the fuck out of the way. Like, you know, these guys got it just like, you know, yep. I had my time to have it. So when I reached 20, I was an army SAR major, which would have been like a warrant for you guys. Um, yes. I just felt like I went from being a soldier to like uh, a leader, you know, a leader in combat. Uh, when I became a SAR major, I felt like I was army management and I was never mentally in a place to be management, you know, and you know, some guys are more political than others. So they'll thrive at those jobs. It was, 
it was a slow death for me. So because I had so many awards and, you know, how many guys in, even in the unit did a singleton mission. I had, I had been everywhere, checked all the boxes I needed to get promoted. And the reality is, is when I got promoted mentally, that wasn't the place for me. I was a guy on one of the teams. You know what I mean? No, totally. You join for a reason. You don't join to become a sergeant major of an SF unit. You join to be an SF soldier. But sadly, when it comes to flying a desk, it isn't, it's, you would be like a cage bloody bear. I was, I was, I was, uh, I hated my life. I was mad every day. You know what I mean? And uh, I bet there's a lot of people out there still to this day hate me. You know what I mean? Because they come in my office. I'd be like, state your business. And they'd be like, well, uh, but uh, 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 get the fuck out too slow. Like, John, they won't hate you. They'd just probably say he was a right miserable old sod when he was the sergeant major. <laughs> I, know, I know. But man, I hated being a uh, sergeant major because I wasn't army management. Um, you know, they made me the money SAR major. Like I had to learn how to procure the money. And, and then, you know, I come, you know, I'd go to MOD headquarters or Hereford to help you guys. And then, you know, American commands are in the way of helping you guys. It's like, it's not your money. It's not your guys. Shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? And like, you know, all your commanders love me. Cause they're like, right, right. Listen to the SAR major. Right. Like, but the truth is, is like, uh, man, it just, that wasn't for me. You know, those fights, those battles, like I was a soldier, I was a leader. If you would have left me do, you know, it's one of the things that you guys do well is a guy could stay on that team forever. And he could say, I don't want to move yeah. up. And you guys do that. The American army is always moving up and you could stay for a certain amount of time, but eventually you're going to have to move on. And, and that's what happened to me. Yeah. So when it was, when I was able to retire, I'm like, I'm out, you know, I'd, I had done everything I wanted to do. Like, you know, when I joined the army, like I wanted to go to war, I wanted to be tested. I wanted to succeed. I wanted to do all this stuff and achieve all these things. And then by the time my 20 years came, like I was tired of that shit. I'd done so much of that shit. It's not even funny, you know? One of the things that guys don't talk about is, you know, uh, the Mogadishu guys, the Black Hawk Downs. You know how many of those we did? Yeah. Like hundreds, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like in yeah. Mogadishu, yeah, yeah. it was one Black Hawk Down. And I'm not taking away from any of those guys. I know most of them. I love every one of them. But you know how many hot HLs, you know, hey, uh, helicopter got shot down in Yusufia. We're going in to find the guys who shot the helicopter down to kill them oh, by the way, we're landing where they just shot down a helicopter. Like, whose fucking idea is this? Like, there's only, there comes a time where I'm like, I achieved everything I wanted to achieve and I was ready to move on. So you started SOB Tactical. Is uh, SOB what I think it stands for? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it actually <laughs> means the Sheriff of Baghdad. All right, yeah. I was thinking yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can read into it. It's fine. You know, hey, my mom wasn't too happy with it when she figured it out. But, uh, you know, she got used to it. Um, but yeah, uh, look, I retired. You know, I, I worked in for the King of Jordan at the compound in Jordan for a while. I worked in the UAE for the King of the UAE, at the Ministry of in, uh, Intelligence for a while. So I had done some contracting, some other stuff. And then I um, I, a guy told me to come teach a rifle class somewhere and then I would get paid and is right by my grandparents' house. So I'm like, I could get paid to go see my grandparents. Why wouldn't I do this? And that was kind of like my first classes. And I just scheduled classes like around my grandparents or my parents or whatever, just to go see family and get make a few bucks at the same time. And then um, it just kind of expanded from there, man. And then, um, as I was just kind of teaching a few classes a year, you know, I started doing the video technology. Like if, it, if I don't videotape it and we don't look at it in slow-mo and I don't get to draw lines on it, it didn't fucking happen because I can't tell you how much time you and I wasted doing bullshit that wasn't helping us. Thinking this is how we do it. You know what I mean? When really there's smarter ways to do it, to get better quicker. So I try to break all this stuff down and then, you know, Hey, here's, here's the deal. Here's what I see on the video. I'll show you what I see on the video. 
And uh, I get a lot of hate from the gun community in the United States because I'm outside their party line. You know what I mean? Well, I'll, John, I'll tell you one thing. What they will never have experienced is rounds coming inbound no, yeah, when, totally. you're tra- when, when you're putting rounds onto a target. And that is a unique skill. You see so many, many in so much footage where you, may, you know somebody's returning fire, but the, the shooting yeah. is over running the wall. Away over and, the wall. Yeah, yeah, and that's something unique that they, them people will never. It's probably jealousy, you know, rather than hatred, um, because it takes, a, as you know, it takes a special person to stand yeah. and return fire when them bee stings are coming or them hornets are coming past your head. No, very true, you know, but. Um... Yeah, because I do the video, I speak to what I see on the video, right? Um, You know, I'm outside of the normal gun industry guys that they're all saying the same stuff, you know what I mean? Mm. But you you, you obviously enjoy it and it's a passion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Man, I I teach the classes I want to teach. I teach where I teach, you know, I can do anything I want if I... If I wanted to go like uh, somewhere on vacation, I could just not schedule classes then. And mm. so uh, no complaints. I, I built the world I live in and I love every minute of it. What uh, state are you based in? I still live at Bragg. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's nice, but I still live here. <laughs> no, you can't, take, you can't take that away. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. John, listen, I've, t- I've, gone about, I've gone way over time with you and I've taken so much time, and it's, but it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And, uh, yeah, man, it's good. You know, I, I, um, I, I wish you all the best and, um, and thank Thanks. you so much for, for doing this. Life or Death with Chris Ryan, brought to you by 1129 Media. Get in touch with the podcast at Chris Ryan Pod on Instagram and Twitter.